Okay, in this session, I'm going to talk about the, the Brayton cycle and um, derive the thermal efficiency of, of this cycle. Okay, so first of all, what is it and how does it apply to uh, real power applications? Well, the Brayton cycle is the thermodynamic cycle that forms the basis for um, gas turbines. And so we've got an example here. And so just to remind you of the operation of this. So air is drawn in at the front um, through the compressor. Okay. And so this can be thought of our kind of induction here. So the air comes in here. As it goes through the compressor blades, that air is um, compressed, obviously. Uh, increases in pressure. So eventually it goes into the, um, into the burners, where obviously fuel is added. Um, and that's burned with the air in the um, combustion cans. And the high temperature, um, uh, high pressure um, exhaust products exit the the uh, the combustion cans, and go over another series of blades. But this time, these are turbine blades, so they're expanding the the um, the gas as it goes out the exhaust, and extracting work from that. And that will either produce that produces thrust itself, but it also, um, you can see that the turbine and the compressor are connected via a common shaft. So as this spins around, that's doing the work to compress the gas um, uh, that's being drawn in. So we've got the induction, compression, combustion and exhaust um, parts of this cycle. And that's kind of, you know, you could roughly um, say it's analogous to a reciprocating engine and that we've got the induction stroke, compression stroke, combustion and exhaust strokes. But that's all kind of happening in a gas turbine, but just continuously um, as you go through through the device. So this is what's happening um, schematically. So we're bringing air into the compressor, uh, combusting it and exhausting products. But this doesn't help us in terms of a cycle. I mean, this is what happens in terms of practice. But this isn't a cycle because it's not closed. And we had the same problem with the um, uh, the reciprocating engines for the diesel and um, auto cycles in that we used an air standard assumption because in those cycles also we're just inducting air and exhausting products. So we need to close this. So the way that we kind of close this is that we assume that we have a um, constant pressure heat exchanger here, um, which is rejecting heat, uh, the leftover heat um, uh, from the turbine to um, uh, bring the air in the cycle back to its original state to go into the compressor, so to do work, add heat, extract work, and so on and so on. Okay, so uh, what does this look like on a... Um, PV diagram. Um, well, we've got the points one, two, three, and four here as so we go around this cycle. So, if we start off at point one, where we're inducting air into the um, uh, into the gas turbine, so it's relatively low pressure here, obviously um, atmospheric pressure. And then the other side of the um, compressors, you would expect, um, is much higher pressure, and we're doing work on that. And if this is um, obviously we're talking about an ideal cycle, so we can we're saying this process is isentropic in the same way that we said the combustion stroke for the diesel and auto cycles were was isentropic. Okay, then what we're doing here is we're adding heat as we go from um, by burning the fuel as we go from two to three, and that's an isobaric process because uh, there can't be any build up of pressure in here because it's open, the cans are open, the, the exhaust products can come out. So this is a constant uh, pressure, an isobaric um, heat addition. The exhaust gases then flow over the turbine as we go from three to four, and we can assume that that's an isentropic um, uh, work is done isentropically um, over the turbine as we um, drop the pressure from the exit of the combustion can to again down to atmospheric, and then to close the cycle, as we said, we have isobaric um, heat rejection. The same thing can be shown on the TS plot <coughs> with the um, as with the other two and um, so the obviously on a, a TS plot an isentropic process is shown as constant entropy so it's a straight line where only temperature increases as, as the work is done in um, as we add heat we've got the isobaric so an increase in temperature and entropy isentropic uh, work output and then um, uh, isobaric um, heat rejection where temperature and entropy drops as we go around this cycle. 
Okay, so we're now going to go around and derive the um, uh, thermal efficiency for this cycle. And we're going to use exactly the same method that we used um, for the auto and for the diesel cycle to do this. So the thermal efficiency um, for any cycle is the work done over the heat in. Um, now, if you remember, I've made a step here that because we go in from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 back to 1, the change in internal is energy, therefore the net work done is equal to the net heat supplied. So that's got Q net on the top, okay? So the thermal efficiency is Q net over Q in. Um, Q net is obviously the um, heat supply between 2 to 3 minus the heat rejected between 4 and 1. And that all boils down to this function here, 1 minus Q, uh, 4 to 1 over uh, Q between 2 and 3. Now we know um, we got functions for Q as um, the, the um, specific heat, so we can rewrite this form as the thermal efficiency is MCP uh, delta T. Um, we're using CP, obviously this is isobaric constant pressure process here. And you can see that um, obviously these two terms will cancel, the M and CP top and bottom, and we'll just be left with this um, as a function of temperature. Now before I do that, um, just want to talk about it. So just to remind you of the process. So we're going to try and express this um, in the simplest form possible. And the way that we're going to do that is first we're going to express the thermal efficiency in terms of temperature ratio. At the minute we've got it expressed in terms of temperature, um, obviously if we cancel these two terms, so it's just in terms of temperature, but we want it in terms of temperature ratio and the temperature ratio between each of the processes. The second thing that we need to do is we need to write all the processes in terms of temperature ratio, go around from 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4. Then if we substitute the temperature ratios that uh, for each process that we derived into the thermal efficiency that we got in terms of temperature ratio, then we can um, uh, boil it down to a nice uh, derivation for the thermal efficiency. Okay, so expressing the um, thermal efficiency in terms of temperature ratio. So we had this term here from the previous slide. Um, obviously, with those two terms are cancelled. And if we start to get this in terms of temperature ratio, so we can take T1 out of the top bracket, T2 out of the bottom bracket, um, which is fine, but this is still isn't um, a particularly great term. We want it all in terms of temperature ratio between 1 and 2, 2 and 3, or 3 and 4 if we can get it. So we can use a little bit of mathematical trickery um, to recognise that um, T4 over T1 is the same as T4 over T3, T3 over T2, and T2 over T1. And then obviously T3 is cancelled, T2 is cancelled, and you're left with exactly the same thing. But now we have the thermal efficiency as a function of all the temperature ratios between 1 and 2, 2 and 3, and 3 and 4. Okay, So now we just need to write uh, um, processes or derive expressions for the processes between these temperature temperatures and then we can substitute it into here. Okay, so um, we're going to derive, um, uh, get each of the processes in terms of a temperature ratio. So starting obviously from 1 to 2, so um, this is an isentropic, uh, polytropic process. So we can re use this relationship um, between Tp and gamma. Um, so if we rearrange this, we can get uh, T2 over T1, which is our temperature ratio, which is what I'm trying to find out, as a function of our pressures um, uh, to a function of gamma. Now, if we look at, um, we've got P2 over P1. Now, we're going to call that our pressure ratio, okay? The ratio between the, um, our effectively iso um, atmospheric pressure and the pressure of the combustion can. So, we're going to write that as RP, that's our pressure ratio. If we do the same thing from 2 to 3, so we're trying to find the temperature ratio from 2 to 3. Um, from the ideal uh, gas law, we've got um, this relationship between PV and T. Um, P v over t is equal to a constant and um, because obviously the pressures are the same because it's isobaric uh, p2 and p3 cancel uh, we're left with the relationship between um, t3 um, over t, uh, t2 is v3 over v2 and we're just going to call this the volume ratio just for the time being just to make it a bit neater okay so we've got our v and then uh, finally, going from 3 to 4, again, this is a polytropic process, so we can use the same relationship uh, we used for the first process. 
but obviously from going from one to two we're going from uh, three to four and if we rearrange that we get um, t4 uh, over t3 is p4 over p3 um, but the difference here is if we remember um, p4 on the top is um, the same as p1 and p3 is uh, the same as p2 so this um, relationship is the inverse of this relationship so just note that minus sign. so we you see inverse of the um, so one over rp to so gamma minus one over gamma okay so we've been around the cycle we've now got um, all of the processes one to two two to three three to four in terms of temperature ratio um, expressed here so now so those are from the previous slides so now what we can do is we can substitute those into the thermal efficiency which remember we've got expressed in terms of temperature ratio so if we substitute each of these in uh, into the um, uh, relevant processes uh, we end up with this expression here and I'll just turn on the pen um, so to do some cancelling so you can see that we, these two terms uh, cancel we're now left with uh, RV minus 1 over RV minus 1 so those cancel and now we're left with this final expression. So the thermal efficiency is equal to 1 minus 1 over uh, the pressure ratio as a function of gamma. Um, obviously there's not much we can do with um, gamma, that's the um, fixed property for air. Um, but one thing we can change in, is our, in our gas turbine is the um, pressure ratio. Okay, And so you can see that as you increase pressure ratio, then this term becomes smaller so the thermal efficiency um, increases overall. I've shown that for you um, uh, graphically on this slide. So you can see that the uh, this is the ideal thermal efficiency at going up here, and then this is the pressure ratio along the bottom. So as you increase the pressure ratio, you also increase your ideal thermal efficiency. So it's no surprise then that um, you can see this is now a timeline um, so we've got years along the bottom and overall pressure ratio that as you're going from these Pratt & Whitney um, uh, gas turbines right up to the latest GE uh, variant you can see the pressure ratio is increased threefold going from the pressure ratio of uh, 20 to 1 now up to 60 to 1 so you can see that they're always chasing more and more uh, ideal thermal efficiency so we're moving from thermal efficiencies or ideal thermal efficiencies I should say in the late 50s, you know, uh, about 56, 57 percent, something like that. Now, pushing closer to 69, 70 percent uh, thermal efficiencies. Um, there's obviously a limit to um, the pressure ratio that you can achieve in a gas turbine, because um, okay, it's, you get much better thermal efficiency theoretically, but you've got to be able to build in. It's still got to be able to take those pressures. So you're going to start reaching. Uh, you always well rather you have reached but you're always pushing the um the boundaries of what's capable uh from an engineering point of view in terms of the materials that you have got available to you uh, to build these devices that will take these um pressure ratios 